now call this regular workshop meeting of Jacksonville City Council to order. I want to welcome everyone who's come out tonight uh, for a special occasion that we're going to have. Uh, bad news is the doors are locked and will not open till the end of the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Okay. Uh, at this time, I would like to ask Logan. Uh, well, let me read this first. The North Carolina. Uh, at our last meeting, uh, the council elected uh, Mr. Logan Sosa to fill the vacant Ward 3 seat that was vacated by Senator Michael Lazar being elected to the North Carolina Senate. Uh, and I would like to have Mr. Sosa, if you would, with your family, if you would join, come up front here. <clears throat> I will now ask uh, Chris, uh, Honorable Christopher Welch, District Court Judge here in Onslow County, to come forward and administer the oath of office. State your name, do solemnly swear. Logan D. Sosa, do solemnly swear that I will support and maintain that I will support and maintain the Constitution and laws of the United States, the Constitution and the laws of the United States, and the Constitution and laws of North Carolina, and the laws and, oops, sorry, for, <laughs> the Constitution of North Carolina, not inconsistent therewith, not inconsistent therewith. And that I will faithfully discharge. That I will faithfully discharge the duties of my office as councilman. That my duties of office of councilman. And maintain and uphold all the laws. And I will, oh, sorry. <laughs> And maintain and uphold. Maintain and uphold all the laws and regulations of the city of Jacksonville. Of the city of Jacksonville. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> sorry. Thank you. Anybody wants to take pictures, you can come forward. Yeah, come on up here where you can get a good picture. I'll now ask Council Member Logan Sosa if he will join us at the dice, and we've got you a seat right there. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank yes, you. <clears throat> Welcome aboard, Logan, and we're very excited to have you joining this council and helping us uh, tackle the, the problems that we see as a city and uh, work together to get a, make build a better Jacksonville, make it a better place for all our citizens to live, work, and play. Thank, thank you. you. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you for having me. Would you like to make any comments at this time? I just like to thank everybody that supported me, especially my wife. She always puts up with me and all my um, my dreams, I guess, and, and this is something I've always wanted to do. And then when this came available, um, I appreciate her supporting me and obviously Owen and the rest of my family and friends that came out today to take time out of their time to be here. I appreciate it. Thank you. Any other council members wish to comment? Just to say I welcome you aboard. I think you'll find the work challenging at times, but mostly interesting and highly rewarding to be able to work for the good of the community. So welcome aboard. Appreciate it. Thank you. And I'd like to say that uh, you've already accomplished something that we direly needed was to lower the average age. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, I concur with that. <laughs> <laughs> Being I was the youngest. 
But uh, welcome aboard. I think you'll be a great asset. You know, I look forward to working with you going forward. I appreciate that. Right. Thank you very no problem. much. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Brian. Congratulations to you on the most beautiful one. <laughs> there you go. I'll second that one, too. All right. <laughs> okay. So we're going to get down to business now. Uh, first off, we're going to start uh, by adoption of the proposed agenda for tonight's meeting. And you should have already gotten a copy of the agenda. Yes, feel free to leave uh, if you want to. You're welcome to stay. But... <laughs> Mr. Mayor. Move, move for the adoption of the agenda. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Aye. Okay. Oh, by the way, uh, Council Member Warden will be joining us by Zoom. Uh, hey, Bob, how's it going? Getting better, but I'm doing okay. Doing Thanks. Better? Okay, good deal. Uh, next, we'll have the adoption of the minutes from the March 16th, 2021 regular meeting. And also, there's uh, several consent items. There's ten cons or seven consent items on the agenda. Move approval of the minutes and the consent items as listed. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. That's everybody. All right. Motion carries. All right, so we'll go ahead and go down to uh, the workshop items that begin with uh, number 11 on the agenda for this evening. And this Hello, Moto. Yes, in, in the non-consent items. I'm sorry. That's pretty. Mayor members. <laughs> Mayor members. Sorry right. about that. Uh, item number eight is the annual action plan for the Community Development Block Grant Program. Uh, Tracy Jackson, the director, will be presenting that for your consideration. Tracy. Tracy. Fiscal year 22, as required by our funder, U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Our national goals include providing decent, safe, and sanitary housing, provide a suitable living environment, and expand economic opportunities. The Community Development Block Grant provides communities with resources to address a wide range of unique community development needs and activities. In order to administer the Community Development Block Grant, we have to meet three national objectives. Benefit low and moderate income people, eliminate slum and blight, and address an urgent needs such as national disasters. This is our third year of the annual action plan for all of our five-year consolidated plan. This plan will include all of our activities, outcomes, and a budget. The planning process includes gathering citizens' input on housing and community development activities. We expect to receive about $369,000 along with our program income, which is going to be about $221,000. As you can see, our annual funding allocation has decreased over the last 10 years. We have decreased an amount of about $200,000. Our proposed activities in our plan includes clearance and demolition, homeownership, and acquisitions, to name a few. Our budget revenue for our regular allocation includes our program income as well for a total of $590,000. And with that $590,000, all of our expenses include administration, public improvement, residential rehab, and nonprofits. Last year, we had three agencies apply for our CDBG nonprofit funding. They requested their, their amounts, their applications were reviewed, and they were funded with the uh, amounts shown. This year, those three, same three agencies, they are they applied and they were reviewed and we recommended the same level of CDBG funding. As priorities are identified, the needs increase and our resources decrease. 
So it can be challenging in how we administer our funds. <coughs> CDBG funds can be used citywide, but we also have target areas such as country club villas, New River and downtown. So we are recommending that city council adopt and approve our annual action plan to submit to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development by May 15, 2021. That's all I have. <coughs> yes, sir. Ms. Jackson, can you explain uh, program income? Program income is received <coughs> from our loans that we have on our activities, on our rehab activities. So when we complete a rehab project, some of those folks, they will qualify to be able to pay some of that grant funds back. So that's, that's the program income I'm referring to. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, Tracy, I've attended a few, um, I guess, ribbon cuttings for the homes that we've produced over the years. When, yes. When's the most recent one and are we, do we have anything on track? Well, the most recent one we purchased and we renovated some lots on Sherwood Road. So we have completed two houses in Sherwood Road. It was probably last year in 2020, no, in 2019. <clears throat> one of our challenges, let me address that a second. One of the challenges that we have is the price of materials that have gone up substantially in the last uh, 60 day, I'm sorry, in the last six months. Uh, Tracy and her staff uh, have brought forth two homes that we've planned on building uh, for home ownership. In both cases, the contract prices uh, were received. We worked out all the details and before the contract could be signed, the contractors came back to us and said, we're gonna have to back out of our proposal because the cost of material has risen, so, has risen so large that we cannot meet the guidelines. Right now, as far as building new homes, we're really in a holding pattern. We hope that over the next several months, we will see material prices come down. If you're in the construction industry, you know that uh, decking board for a uh, four by eight sheet of roofing material has gone from $19 a sheet to over $41 a sheet that two by fours have more than, have almost doubled just in the last three months. Mm -hmm. So we really do not anticipate uh, building any new homes for home ownership until we see those prices come down. What we will be focusing on though is continued removal of slum and blight and also rehabbing uh, individuals' homes. Tracy, you wanna add anything to that? Um, it is challenging, unfortunately, um, because of the the client that we serve, their lower income, they only qualify for so much because of their income. So it is challenging uh, to be able to fit them into a the right loan with the right, with the right price. Question? Yes. In follow up to uh, Councilman Bryan's question about program income. I know in the past we've had a marvelous percentage in terms of people paying their loans and mortgages on, on time. Has the COVID affected our percentage of collection? Have we had any defaults that you're aware of? Not that I'm aware of. We, we usually get a printout from finance every month about our aging report, showing that the payments are made on time. And so far we've only had one instant and they've caught up their payments. How many homes have you rehabbed? Has, have been rehabbed in Jacksonville through this program. you have a total number? Since last year or? Since, since we started, I mean, in the last few years. In the last few years, uh, think, we have rehabbed about 10 homes. Okay. That's good. <clears throat> Another point I, I would make is we've spent a significant amount of money in home demolition. Uh, through this department and through the city's workforce, we have now have removed over 140 vacant and dilapidated homes uh, in the last 10 years. So you're, while the program income uh, has been there, uh, we've really concentrated on the removal of slum and blight more than putting people in brand new homes. And I think that 
you know, while everyone has their priority, if you can clean up a neighborhood by removing two or three slum and blight houses and increase the entire value of the block for all those who continue to live there, I think you've done a good thing. So you ought to be commended for your commitment to the removal of slum and blight. Any other questions? Um, How many organizations applied for the grants? There were a total of seven organizations that applied. We also have a public-private partnership. We try to match the organization with the funding restrictions as far as CDBG and general funds. So we've had six that were recommended for funding for this year. Um, three of them were CDBG and three of them were public-private partnerships mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for general fund. Mm -hmm. Other questions? We need formal action on the part of the council to approve the action plan for fiscal year 21-22. Just so, to adopt the plan. Just a motion to adopt the plan. I make a motion to adopt the plan. Okay. Discussion? <coughs> Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Uh, all the time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a very yeah, late. It's coming over pretty loud there. <clears throat> oh, thank you, Tracy. Well done. Next uh, on the agenda is item number <clears throat> nine, and this is the old fire station on Barn Street, uh, fire station number two. And uh, Dr. Woodruff is going to cover this one, and Mr. Okay. Carter. Mr. Mayor and Council, if you let me begin, I'll let Dr. Woodruff end. Uh, I want to just, for the benefit of the viewing public and Mr. Sosa, to give you a little history on fire station number two on Barnes Street. I've spent many an hour over there uh, over the last few months, actually since August of 2020, with prospective buyers, with contractors looking at the building for those prospective buyers, and this is some of that history. There's actually two plaques on that building, and it's not the only city building I know that has two plaques, and it has two primarily because there's two administrations. It was begun and finished in 1963, but as you note, that was an odd year, so there was a city council election. At that time, every two years, the council was totally up for re-election along with the mayor. It started under Mayor Pete Page's administration in 1963, and it was finished under Mayor A.D. Guy Duke guy in 1963. So the two plaques are there. I checked with my fire chief today, and he says that it was actually abandoned as far as the fire department in 2016. So that's 53 years of use uh, as a fire department. And of course, since then, it's still what I believe to be an iconic building in that neighborhood because it's been there for 58 years. When the Fire station was abandoned in 2016. There was a couple of things that the city looked at. One, as you'll recall, was the Children's Museum. They wanted to see if that was a possible location for them, and they did look at it. And as part of that uh, investigation, there was a remediation of the asbestos, so we have a clean asbestos report, as well as any, there's no lead paint in the building. The uh, Children's Museum, as you know, decided to locate, which I think is, again, the, was the right uh, idea here on New Bridge Street. And if we get past the pandemic, I'm sure they'll get back into full-fledged uh, operation. The additional uh, folks that looked at it was recreation. And I know the manager can speak to this, but because of the cost of renovation for a building, a city building, that the public would have access to, that was prohibitive at that time. And he can talk about those numbers, but uh, I talk about some of them in, in this report here. So in August of 2020, you gave me the authority to go out and start looking for folks to come and to buy it. <clears throat> and of course, as you'll recall, we got an initial bid of $120,000. The tax value on the property is $147,840, with 107 of that tax value being the building itself. Uh, so you got a $40,000 lot, is, is what the tax office says. But we did get the $120,000 bid, and pursuant to the upset bid process, we had to go out and have it uh, subject, and we got another bid. And it, uh, it was the $126,000. Now, a gentleman put down over like $6,300 worth as a deposit. And he began trying to get financing. 
And as we reported back to you back in, I think it was February, that this gentleman finally, after several months, just threw up his hands and says, you know, I can't get financing. And I found that to be true. And I want to share with you some of the things that I found, uh, and it's in my agenda item, to be true as far as that. The pro and, and the council, again, wanted it sold and used as a single-family residence. It is zoned R7, or single-family residence. So there wasn't a problem with zoning or whatever, but the banks, according to that prospective buyer, who actually lost, as I said, his $6,300 deposit because he couldn't come through with the money, but that they were not interested in loaning because there was no other comparables uh, for that type of a structure. Plus, there was a, a lot of consideration uh, there. But anyway, I found that not only to be true from that particular uh, person, but as I began the re-attempt to try to find another buyer, I always made them aware to look at that, and several of them came back and said, you're right, banks just aren't interested in loaning on this building for whatever reason. Uh, again, no comps, et cetera. <clears throat> Excuse me. The other reason that we've had difficulty finding a buyer is that with the fire station, there are structural changes that will have to occur to make that habitable. If you can visualize with me the front of it, you kind of see those windows. If you wonder, there's three rooms there uh, in the center of that building. Each one of those rooms has windows of a certain height. All of those windows are too high for a bedroom to go in there. So whoever bought it, among other structural changes, would have to actually go in and if it was going to be a, a bedroom, which would have to actually knock the wall out, put a door in or something you have to have you know, where you can get out in case of a fire. So there was cost like that. And of course, the roof itself. And uh, one of the, again, I've, like I said, I've met with contractors. Except one of the contractors came back to uh, redo the roof, and I think the city even got a higher price than this when we were looking at it for recreation, it was like the $45,000, $50,000 range just to do the, the roof itself. And the bottom line kind of came back, some folks said, you know, even if we put down $120,000 or $100,000, and we took another 100000 or so and put in it, we're going to be the highest uh, home in the neighborhood. Uh, the other homes there don't fall in those comparables and so forth. So those are three, three things, and there's probably others, that I'd had a great deal of difficulty in. And with the bank situation, I was actually looking for folks who had cash money because, again, uh, they would have to put that up, and maybe later on down the road they could get a bank to do it. So I was talking to Dr. Woodruff, and he, I know, was looking at another property to put the traffic signal section of your transportation department uh, in that as far as storing all the signals. you got three or four trucks, and he'll talk about that in a moment, et cetera. But I said, you know, just look at this building and see. And so he's going to talk about that in a moment. Uh, but I never stopped. I never stopped trying to sell it. And so last week, I was still over there trying to sell it. And I, therefore, you had an amendment to your agenda item. And you have before you also tonight a $75,000 offer uh, to, to buy it. Uh, again, looking at that and what the tax value is, again, that's y'all's call as to whether you want to do that. Let me just tell you how that process uh, works. When we sell property, uh, you do it pursuant to the upset bid process in most cases. And so even if the council tonight says, we'll, we'll take that as the initial bid, it's, it doesn't stop there. There's a 10-day period where we do an ad and we see if there's any upset bids, and it's not just a dollar or five dollars. There's a certain percentage that has to be above that. Just like I said, it went from 120,000 to 126,000, some change for it to, and that was the next step when we had the bids back last year. So again, there would be an opportunity. I can tell you, I don't believe you're going to get back up to the 120, 126,000 dollars just because of conversations I've had with prospective buyers and some of the contractors that they brought on site. But my point being, even if you decided to do that, it would not be finished if you had no upset bids. It would still have to come back to council at your next or the, uh, some meeting in the future where you would have to confirm that sale if no one else came forward. So it's always up to the council. The council's always got the authority to accept or not accept. Now, having said all that, I would say if you do not believe that you want to sell it for $75,000 or a few thousand dollars more, then you need to listen to Dr. Woodruff and let, he will talk to you about the traffic signal uh, component here as far as using it for repurposing it for a city purpose, which again, I concur with him that that is what you really need to be looking at. 
But I wanted to tell you from the legal standpoint what your options were and to kind of give you that background. And I'd be glad to answer any questions, but it might be best to hear from him first, and we both will, will sit here and answer for you. Yeah, what <clears throat> Thank you, John. Uh, as, a, as an attorney, John is stellar. As a real estate agent, he has not been very successful. <laughs> but I will tell you, he does have a bid. And I will also tell you, to say that he has shown it at least 20 times is not an understatement. He knows, the, he knows that building. He knows the combination. He knows every issue that's in that building. He's met with the fire marshal, the building officials, contractors, and many, many others. It had been our initial thought when we vacated the building for fire purposes, you'll recall that Recreation wanted to move into the building. And we actually allocated $188,000 to retrofit the building. The retrofitting was required for two reasons. Number one, it's a change of occupancy. Number two is it does not meet ADA standards because the ADA standards come into play once it becomes a public building. By a public building, that's not a term of ownership. It's a term of ability to enter the building. As a recreation facility, obviously, it becomes a public building. As we work through that, you'll recall that the Barn Street facility is only two blocks away from the Northwoods Recreation Center. As we began to look further and further at the cost, and the cost began to climb, my recommendation to you at that time was, let's abandon the idea of having two rec centers two blocks apart. Let's take the $188,000 and let's look at doing something with Northwoods. So that resulted in us deciding, you deciding it was a good idea just to sell it. Because of the issues of selling it, we have gone back to reevaluate what city needs could go in the building. And one of the criteria that we had is, is there something that we need that would allow us to move into the building without a change of occupancy and without triggering the ADA standards? We have found that use. Your traffic division, as you know, they're responsible for all of the intersections inside the city and many of them outside the city and many of them on the base. They have equipment, they have personnel, they need office space. You will recall that when that department was established probably seven years or so ago, we made space available to them, but they are really scattered throughout the public works complex. They can occupy that building with minimal renovation. Why is that? Well, the building code says that it was a governmental use and the building code allows them to occupy it as a governmental use. So we do not have to retrofit the building because of a change of occupancy. And those of you who are in construction can understand that in itself saved us a lot of money. The second issue is since it's not open to the public, we do not have to retrofit bathrooms or doors. It does not have to be ADA uh, accessible. So once again, all of the cost of retrofitting bathrooms and those type things are now set aside. We do have to address some improvements to the building. However, they are not nearly to the level that recreation was looking. Therefore, we're recommending tonight that you approve us Two things. Number one, that you authorize the attorney to reject the latest bid. Number two, that you authorize the staff to move forward with the necessary changes, which I'll explore in just a minute with you, to move your transportation traffic division into that building, and that you allocate roughly $125,000 for the retrofitting of the building. What is that retrofitting? It's addressing the roof. It's addressing some security issues because they're going to be putting into the building a lot of very expensive equipment. You have windows that, uh, that are very uh, transparent and you don't want to have uh, people just walking by looking in windows and doors and we've already had some vandalism, people breaking into that building. So we will be changing those things out. The building for a substantial portion is occupiable with a lot of paint and a lot of love. 
Uh, we're going, we plan on polishing the floors rather than putting in any type of tile. We are going to have to put back in, obviously, new restroom facilities as far as heads and sinks, but we're not having to modify the restrooms to any substantial amount. And we will be putting back in workstations and a kitchen. The money will come from existing traffic budgets. As you know, the traffic budgets are established over a period of years as program budgets. Part of that money is, uh, is money from the NCDOT, and part of that money is general fund money, which you are required to put in. So that money already is in their budgets. The last thing that you must consider, though, is we will need to rezone the property to a special use. You will recall that when we discussed putting recreation in that facility, that while it is zoned residential, any type of governmental use, including the fire station, was required to have a special use permit. You went through a special use permit application, public hearings before the Planning Commission, and eventually a public hearing before the City Council, and you approved a special use permit for recreation. However, it was for recreation. So to move forward, we will need to have a special use permit approved for this governmental use. As a side note, we have been looking for space for the traffic division for some time. We have found other space. I will tell you that it is significantly more expensive and it is not upfitted. So you are looking what I think is a very reasonable cost I have been assured by the staff that if you approve this, that that can be the home of transportation, tra uh, of, uh, of transportation traffic division for at least a minimum of five to seven, maybe even 10 years. So the request before you is several fold. Number one, to give direction on the bid. We recommend you reject it. Number two, that you authorize the staff to move forward with the necessary work to turn this into the area for the traffic division. And number three, that you also recognize you will need a special use approval, which you obviously can't address tonight, but just heads up, you will need a public hearing in order for them to eventually move into the building. Uh, Mr. Carter, any points I've missed? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Council, any questions? I do have one question. Yes, sir. So if that happens, what would you said there's going to be a fence and trucks? Would that be kind of make it look nice for the neighborhood? I actually grew up down the street from there. I used to play at that fire department as a kid. So it's kind of, you know, it's nice that it's going to be safe, not torn down. And um, but I just curious, is it going to look nice for the, you know, the neighbors that live around there? So it's going to be like a mechanics or like a shop. While the general building uh, has not really deteriorated, there are certain components. Uh, we need to dress up the landscaping. We need to fix a little bit of painting in the outside. What we will do is put up a fence in the back area so that any of the equipment that is stored outside can be screened. And also that while vehicles are there in the evening, they will be screened and be behind the building or they will be in the work bays. So, it will be, I think, refurbished where it's a benefit to the neighborhood. Thank you. Where is the signal division located now? They're actually located in three different components of the public works complex. They share space in the utility water maintenance area. They have two outdoor storage buildings that are generally, let's say, you know, 14 <coughs> by 16, and they are air conditioned. So those spaces will then be turned back over to your public works department. Mr. Mayor, I think it's important and, uh, to note that the manager took Mr. Prince and Mr. Prince took his staff and they've all visited the building and has reported back to me that they thought this was a good location. They're not taking a hit for the team, but they really think this is a, a good location. Uh, you might want to speak. Everything John <coughs> said is correct. <laughs> There are five personnel. <clears throat> yes. So, Council, uh, we then instruct the attorney and the uh, manager to move forward in repurposing this facility for purposes of our signals division. 
they move, can... move that the attorney be authorized to reject the bid offer and that the administration and manager move forward with the rehabilitation of the former fire station for the signal division. No motion? Is there a second? Okay. A motion and a second. Any further discussion? Oh, what? Question. Question. Okay. Should my motion be contingent upon the special yes, permit? Yes, sir. We, we, we will not move forward with any expenditures until you grant the, if, or you, you don't grant the special so use permit. So that'll be a subsequent agenda item? Yes, sir. We'll make it as soon as possible. We've already got staff in the planning department working on it. All right. <clears throat> Fine. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed. Aye. Motion carries. Okay. Good job. <laughs> Next, we have the uh, NC. Uh, Does this mean, excuse me, that John is no longer up for Realtor of the Year award? <laughs> he lost that honor. I have to go back to lawring, <laughs> lawring I guess. <laughs> <clears throat> The agenda item number 10 is the designation of a voting delegate for the 2021 North Carolina League of Municipalities Virtual City Vision. Uh, it's going to be April 20th through the 22nd, and each member of municipality is asked to designate one voting delegate who is eligible to cast a, a single vote for the 2021-22 uh, 20, League Board of Directors in advance of the annual business meeting. Um, skip on down. There's no indication that the selected voting delegate must also be registered to attend City Vision. However, currently registered for City Vision are uh, myself, Mayor Phillips, Council Member Brian Jackson, and Councilwoman Dr. Washington. Move that the mayor be authorized to be the voting voting delegate for the. Uh, League of Municipalities Convention. Second. Second. We close the nominations and accept by acclamation. So moved. Second. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Next, we need to appoint an uh, alternate delegate. Uh, Anybody want to make a nomination on that? I nominate Dr. Washington to be a uh, alternate delegate. Okay. Second. Mm -mm. That's going to be doing work hours, so I will have to decline on that one. Okay. Would you mind? I will have. To, that's going to take place. The voting is going to be taking place during my hours of working, uh -huh. so I'll have to decline the nomination. Mr. Jackson? Question. Mm -hmm. For, uh, the district two position. So am I able to actually be a, a alternate delegate? Well, that's a good question. I, I know, of, you know, I think that's a Paul Meyer question. I think so too, <laughs> but I would go ahead uh, if, since he's the only other person that's well, going and, just, and having the alternate may not even be called upon for you to right, vote. Yeah, so I'd more, put you, you in the call. <laughs> But again, it's optional, but we'll, we'll do it anyway. Okay. There might be some other business matters you have to vote on, so if, if I call out or something. Well, let me let me address that. I do, okay. I do know that when Mr. Lazara was the voting delegate in your absence, Mayor, that he was actually the president of the league. Oh, okay. So I'm, I would assume that if he did not have a conflict, you would not have a conflict, sir. Yeah, I would verify so, it, though. We Just, will verify that. Yeah. Okay. We good with that? Alternate de delegate? Will Mr. Jackson be authorized to be the alternate voting delegate at the convention? Second, sir. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Thank you, sir. Thank you for doing that. No problem. So we're going to move on now to the workshop topics for the evening. And first off, we're going to have master plans for city parks, part three. 
back. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor and Council, and welcome, obviously, Mr. Sosa. We're thrilled to be back for the last round of our discussions on our master plans. We've had two so far, so you'll uh, you, we'll quickly run through. Uh, starting back in March 2nd, we discussed these parks, Jack Emmett, Kerr Street, Riverwalk Crossing Park, Wilson Bay, and Riverwalk Marina. Uh, and then we came back on March 16th, and we further discussed Georgetown, Phillips, Wooten, Country Club, and the Commons Recreation Complex. And I'll show those maps to you just to jog your memory. It's been three weeks, so if you have any. Uh, and then tonight we're going to go over Richard Ray, Northeast Creek, and the Jacksonville Landing. And then hopefully come back in May at adoption for the plan. All right. So uh, as a quick overview, this was this is Georgetown. And you'll see, no, yes, yes. So this is Georgetown. Quickly, uh, we discussed the walking trail, the ball field, basketball court, playground. This is Phillips Park, or uh, the duck, as we like to call it. And we have multiple playgrounds, a boardwalk, or and a launch along with better flow through the park and just a nicer feel overall for the kids and the families. And then we have uh, Wooten, Wooten Park, sorry. Wooten Park, this is off of Ellis Boulevard. And again, not a whole lot that we're proposing there, but an update to the playground. And then this is the commons. We did discuss uh, a splash pad, miracle field, relocation on some restrooms. Uh, gym, auxiliary gym at the top of the facility. And then we will move right into across the street from the commons, which is Richard Ray. So Richard Ray is in really good shape, but we do have some logistical challenges at Richard Ray. So some of the things we want to just show you in our components is a restroom facility, a little bit closer to the playground and the amphitheater. So we have that as a component. We have obviously shelters, the amphitheater, the um, uh, additional parking on the left-hand side. We've learned from our amphitheater and from our concert series that are really popular, as well as our movies, that we need a little bit more parking for our handicap uh, folks that they can easily get in and access and uh, be able to get into the uh, amphitheater and uh, be able to safely maneuver through the park. So our components are a playground with safety surface. We have obviously beautiful gardens, amphitheater, restrooms, open space, some small and large shelters. We have the lab labyrinth, the walking path, and parking. What we're proposing in the CIP is to change those restrooms, basically relocate them so they're a little bit more central to the playground the amphitheater and the parking and the play, um, the rest of the open space. We do have amphitheater enhancements. That's going to be a shell so that everything is protected when we have an afternoon storm come through. It'll have sound, a shell that will help for the sound, as well as weather protection and lighting and, and sound enhancements, mm. and then parking for those handicapped folks in a space that we have next to the amphitheater. So our maintenance is really just what we've discussed previous. Ongoing five-year maintenance is improving the landscape, continual replacement of benches as they wear out, and general maintenance. OK, so Northeast Creek. This is, a, this is a large one. There's so much beautiful potential at this park. And we really looked at this from a perspective of best utilization of the natural space we have, as well as hearing from our citizens um, and what are some of the needs taking advantage of the space we have there. So I can see everybody looking at the map. You'll see, um, logistically, we did reconfigure the entrance so that we have a new entrance coming in to utilize a little bit better of the space along that way. We will continue with the disc golf course. The disc golf course is extremely popular. I was out there this weekend and it, we had a tournament, so it was very nice to see. We do have a restroom facility down by the boat ramp, along with better parking. And then moving uh, counterclockwise, we've obviously got to address the boardwalk, so we have that addressed in the master plan as well. But the largest thing I think we're proposing is some um, lacrosse fields on those lagoons. We hear a lot from our uh, patrons on the need for those uh, types of fields, so we are proposing that we utilize those there at Northeast Creek. As you know, it's a large piece of open space um, and we could utilize, and this is to scale, we could fit four full-size lacrosse fields there. 
as well as reconfigure the ball fields to take advantage of the space there. We utilize those ball fields quite a bit along with the commons. It really does make for a fabulous tournament economic opportunity when you can combine all of the fields total and bring in large tournaments. And then last but not least, there's a square there that does show a community center. We do not have an indoor facility on what, that side of town um, in the Bryn Mawr area, so that wouldn't be one that would have a gym. It would just be really a community center, something for some daytime activities, some fitness, some wellness, um, but nothing on certainly the scale of the commons. So the components, obviously I just kind of went over those, but I'll show that graph as well. Community building, ball field, some exercise, some shelters, the restrooms at the boat ramps, we don't have any currently right now. So we would model any of our restrooms. You can think of what we have at the landing for that concept. Parking, the boardwalk, boat ramp, um, lacrosse fields, restrooms, walking path, the disc golf course. We would uh, like to add a maintenance building there as well as just keeping some of the open and natural space. So I know that's a, a lot to look at. Uh, what we're proposing in the CIP is some of those items like the shelter, uh, community building, restrooms, redeveloping those ball fields with lights, boardwalk, lacrosse fields, and then reconfiguring the entrance and the parking lot. Anybody like to have any questions or shall I move to the playground side? Do lacrosse fields have lights? I think we've proposed them with lights, yes, sir. Okay, I will move across the street. And of course, obviously, there's ongoing maintenance at Northeast Creek. Uh, across the, across the uh, street, uh, the playground side, uh, this is one of the parks we've already started to really address. So we've done a phenomenal job. We've already taken care of the beautiful playground, all-inclusive playground. We have the uh, play, uh, I'm so sorry, the splash pad, the brand new restrooms. Some other things that we'll be addressing is the children's challenge course, which is gonna be a new amenity for, this, for our park system, as well as retrofitting and replacing those restrooms near the far end of the parking lot there. We also would like to add some small shelters and some more you know, passive recreation opportunities there. One thing that, that we need to consider uh, changing before we adopt this is you'll notice out near Corbin, there is a proposed skate park. Mm -hmm. John and I have learned over the last several, uh, well, about the last month, that our insurance carrier, which is the North Carolina League of Municipalities mm -hmm. through their uh, trust, uh, risk management trust services, are going to be eliminating insurance coverage for, for uh, uh, skate parks completely. So while we had the graphic up there, uh, I will say to you that at this time, uh, we, you know, when it comes back to you on May the 4th or whenever you adopt it, that that skate park will be removed. Mm -hmm. While we understand there are a lot of people in this community who like to skate, I hope that the public understands we cannot have any facility that we cannot cover with insurance. And so until we find that, uh, you will find that that component will be coming off of that master plan. It's unfortunate, but there are certain realities. We can tell you that due to insurance claims in several locations where I won't get specific, there were literally multi-million dollar payouts, and that has resulted in the league taking a position they will not be covering any insurance for anyone, whether they're currently there or not. They're going to end that insurance coverage. Mr. Carter, any comment? No, sir. I mean, they, they certainly have taken that position and. Uh, it's one city within this county that's got two losses, be and primarily because of burns uh, on metal pipes and things like that for small children. And so, so it's Swansboro, was yes, it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And so they're still dealing with that. And uh, anyway, it's it's not a good time to plan a skate park. <laughs> <laughs> not, a good, not a good time. Dr. One thing, Walter, yes, ma'am. Um, excuse me. So, in lieu of the skate park going there, are there plans to put something there in its place, or that will be decided on maybe a future use, so it doesn't look very blanketed and without that space being utilized? One thing, Michael, handsome Michael, sitting down there, uh, that Michael has suggested is that we put an outdoor basketball court 
and that we put in a fence so that as the uh, people like me who can't dribble very well lose the ball, it doesn't roll out to Corbin Street. Mm -hmm. So what we are thinking is that we would replace the skate park designation with an outdoor basketball. And I think that'll be pretty heavily used. Mm -hmm. Where's the nearest tennis court to this area? It would be the commons. Could possibly put in a tennis court. We can look at both, and there may be enough land there to actually put in both a basketball court and a tennis court. Mm -hmm. We can look at that. Large space. And this map is a little bit older, those trees, and it's it's been updated since then. We did a lot of work to the playground, to the parking lot. So there's quite a bit of space that's potential to do both. Uh, I'll show you the graphic of the things we just discussed. Obviously, the components are the splash pad, shelters, parking, challenge course, the playground we already have, restrooms, walking path, open uh, space, and then, of course, we're still showing the skate park, but obviously that's going to change. Uh, proposed CIPs are some of those last items that we're currently already working on, which are the shelter and the restrooms on the far end of the parking lot, uh, the sh challenge course, um, walking trail, and then, of course, you can scratch the skate park. And then we will just continue to make the park beautiful, because it is. Uh, before you leave this, since we have a splash pad there, uh, just for the public and the council, when do you plan on opening the splash pad? That is pads? an excellent question, because we are getting calls every day. It's beautiful <laughs> out. Um, unfortunately, we cannot open that splash pad until Memorial Day weekend. Mm -hmm. That is set by the state. It is a permit that we apply for, and it can be open from um, starting Memorial Day weekend, and that's when we will be up and running. So everybody open. watching, yes, they will be open Memorial Day weekend. Um, yes, question added to that. Do you anticipate that we will be utilizing um, the mobile home trailer park um, swimming pool again this summer? We did not opt to do that. Okay. COVID put some challenges on okay. us last year, and we're still faced with those this year. So we have not moved forward with that this year. We are looking actively for swim instructors. We successfully have swim lessons um, in apartments, but uh, those are on a very small and reduced scale. But we'll have swim lessons, but we will not be operating the pool. Just out of curiosity, what, what uh, agency of the state government sets the regulations for what splash pads? Well, we get our permit locally from the Department of Environmental Health, the county's environmental health, and they're the ones that do all of the pools, and splash pads are the same permit as pools. So if you have a seasonal pool, it's a little bit different, but from a state, we can't, we've always been told, you, it's a temporary uh, permit, and it's from Memorial Day to Labor Day. But, Mayor, I, I will say this, if the council, you know, the weather is turning good, if you would like for us to at least explore the possibility of modifying the permit, we're certainly welcome, I mean, certainly willing to do if that. If it's possible, hmm. I would. We'll be happy to, to explore that. A lot of pretty days. Well, you know, Mr. Warden and all of his grandchildren, they use the splash pad very heavily. And uh, Mr. Warden has a new bathing suit, I understand. So we will look into that. Yes, we're happy to do that. And then the last park on our list is the landing. Um, it is a wonderful amenity that the voters and the community are able to utilize. Not a whole lot of um, suggestions here other than you're aware of the property at the top of it, and that is for a welcome center at some point. So um, our list is pretty short. Restrooms, and we have a boat ramp, parking, a uh, boardwalk that goes already underneath the, uh, the bridge there, and then the welcome center. So really all we're proposing is the welcome center for that. And we'll continue to do some maintenance. Any questions on anything you've seen thus far? You talked about putting gardens at Richard Ray. Was it? We have gardens there now. I think existing. I can let Michael speak to it, but they did a beautiful job of, uh, you know, working with what we can grow locally. And so, when Richard Ray All American Park was built, it's it's uh, it was built at the time as the only park like it in the country. Uh, there are nine zones, nine different planting zones out there that basically represent the United States. So for example, and I'll try and make this as easy as, as possible, if you're standing in the parking lot, looking across the park, you're basically starting, on, you're in the Atlantic Ocean and you're going literally, as you go through the park across, across the country. And 
when the park was built originally, we tried to put plants out there that represented each state. And obviously what we found out is not, not all states are created, not all soil is created equal. So what, we've, what we had to do to, to keep the gardens robust is we may not be able to plant a plant from Iowa in this section, but we'll get its sister plant that does well in our climate and that can be there. And if you've not had the chance to go out there, I'd encourage you because there are uh, laminated uh, identification uh, pieces out there telling you about this, this story of the park and uh, what each region represents. And it's kind of neat as you go through America and then finish literally with the Alaska and Hawaii on the last two sections. The uh, <clears throat> amphitheater has kind of probably been hurt pretty bad by COVID as far as getting events. Yeah, we still held events there last year, but it was, you know, ticketed and distanced. But yes, sir, we didn't, we weren't able to offer a lot. We do have a full schedule of activities this summer. Good. Staff is ready to go with concerts and movies. Um, and so we're excited. We're anticipating a great summer. I think everybody's ready, to be honest with you. So. Um, we do have a full schedule of activities, and we will manage the crowd as, as we're allowed to. When do you plan on starting the movie nights? Movie nights, I believe, are the second, uh, I want to say about May 15th. We usually start either that week or week two weeks before Memorial Day weekend. Obviously, those are free to the public. Free to the public, and they're scheduled all the way throughout Memor uh, Labor Day. My, my memory, it's been a while since I've been over to the abundance of parking. It's, it's pretty good. I'm sorry, say that again, sir. Parking availability is it? Yeah. It's fantastic with the park and ride. I've got to be honest. Oh, okay. That park and yeah. ride is such an asset. We have uh, softball tournaments returning, and it's just nice to see that everybody has safe parking, and we can host multiple events when the time comes. Everybody can get to Very and good. from nicely. Park and ride is amazing. Uh, question. Yes, sir. Has it ever been um, considered to have a community garden? at any of the parks or any area? I think that subject has been brought up in the past, uh, but uh, it hasn't gained enough steam for that to be warranted. Yep. I think from our seat, if we were to lead a community garden, I think you need to be prepared that that would require a lot of work from our end to to, to well, upkeep and, and, and... It has been brought to my attention quite yes. a bit. It might be something we might still can look consider. At sure. Because uh, a lot of people are into growing, you know, they're doing the boxes and stuff, handling it in different ways so you could have a better control over it. So just my be understanding, I'm sorry, my understanding is the Cooperative Extension has a pretty yeah. nice um, community garden right. as well um, that they started right before COVID. But yes, the, there is one in case you get asked for right now, uh, the Cooperative Extension does have one. Which is out in there. Yes, sir. Senior it Center, right? Yes, yes, sir. Yeah. Well, we can look into that. But sure. Appreciate that. Thank you. Any other questions real quick? Uh, I'm going to take over from here. My job is to bring us down the stretch run and talk to you a little bit about uh, what, what we have left to talk about in the master plan and, and hopefully how we move forward. Obviously, feel free to ask questions. You see up here diversified local parks. That's Branchwood Park, Brook Valley Park, Sherwood Park. These are what we commonly know as our neighborhood parks. Uh, we didn't bring these to you with maps. These are not, um, these are neighborhood parks. We have basically shelters, playgrounds, trash cans, benches in these parks. These are things that we're just going to have to continue to upkeep as we go through time. This is going to be here, whether there was a master plan or not. These sorts of things are going to continue just like you have seen the general maintenance on all the parks. That's just how we will survive uh, moving forward with these parks. So, one of the other things that we wanted to talk to you about was some of the properties that we currently own that are undeveloped. Williamsburg Plantation, if you're not familiar, we own 17 acres over there. The property does have some challenges. It is adjacent to the existing park land that the HOA owns. Uh, it is landlocked. You need to be aware of that. And there is a large swell running through those 17 acres. So there are some challenges to developing that piece of property. Just be aware of that. Carolina Forest, there's 10 acres there. A um, little bit of challenge over there is the fact that it is behind the school, literally. 
and um, we don't have access to it but through the school currently. So, you know, uh, nice piece of property, but some challenges attached to that. And then the conservation property, which some of us know it to be uh, off of Henderson Extension, or for others, Henderson Extension Extension. Um, and here's a map of them. I'm gonna bring the next one up. It's probably a better represent, oh, it's not there, I'm sorry. It's after so, so you can see Williamsburg within the development, the conservation property, a lot of wetlands in there. We think long-term that could be a piece of property that can do something for the city, but I'm not sure in the short term that's something we're looking to develop. And then Carolina Forest, Obviously, 10 acres is a nice size, but we're not sure for the needs that we need uh, that 10 acres is going to be able to meet that. But we did feel like it was important to bring it to you that these are three pieces of property that are undeveloped and you needed to be aware of that. <clears throat> we're not proposing CIPs for them, as, as I mentioned, and they're not going to be part of the master plan. Now, you know, it was mentioned earlier about putting a basketball court in the place of uh, the skate park at Northeast Creek. One of the great things about what we're doing is it's a fluid master plan. If there's things that as time goes by, three, five years from now, trends change, we'll be able to update the master plan and include them in, in, that master, in this master plan. And as we move forward and apply for grants, they'll be part of it if we see those trends change. And as we all know, trends do change. So just be aware of that. So one of the things I wanted to talk to you about, and, and I think Susan and I definitely want to talk to you about is, you know, in 1960, Jack Amiette was built. As most of you are aware of, some of us spent a lot of time there as children. And uh, in 1997, the Jacksonville Commons was built 37 years later. And what a great facility the Commons is. It has met a lot of needs of this community. And it's a wonderful facility and, and we're so happy to have had it and, and, and continue to have it. But the Jacksonville Commons is 25, 26 years old. I think that we would ask that you as a council consider looking for property within the city limits that meets our population moving forward. You've seen a lot of our master plan over the last 30 days that addresses indoor facilities and ball fields and all sorts of things. Uh, we need to, to continue to grow with our community. We need to be aware of that. We'd ask that you consider if there's our opportunities out there uh, two years from now, three years from now, five years from now, whenever those opportunities are that you look at them because Jacksonville is continuing to grow. We hear how Susan talks about the uh, programs are overcrowded or we have to turn people away. There, uh, if there are opportunities, we ask that you would look at that. Is there any other questions about the master plan part of it? Four. Well, we're going to get to that, Mayor. <laughs> that, the, hopefully that's our best part. You mentioned uh, undeveloped property. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not advocating anything in particular, but memory serves me correctly that off of Western Boulevard in the Commons area, I would say it's probably to the north of Gateway, Gateway Drive, north, the city owns that property. I don't know how many acres it is, but it's a substantial tract. Correct. That's the 210 acres. That's not in your inventory? I think that's a conservation property I was talking about. That's off of, now, now there's, there are, um, you might be talking about, are you talking about the piece of property behind the, what was the seafood place that was coming? Mayflower. Mayflower, or would you be <laughs> referencing back there? Yes. Kimbrels? Yeah, yes. That, yeah, that is some part of there. There are some challenges with that property also. Part of, it, part of it's wet, but yeah. Yeah, and I think there's a good sizable track. I think I, we have looked at it, and I think we could fit maybe one or two rectangular sized fields uh, in that property. We, we actually have looked at that. Okay. Uh, but we can continue to look at that if, if, if that's obviously something we're more than happy to do. 
Also, uh, when you talk about the property as you come in uh, there on Gateway North, we have a piece of property that goes from uh, Western Boulevard all the way back to the Commons Loop. Now, that property, uh, of course, it's generally adjacent to the fire station number four. Uh, that property we have proposed to City Council in the past to actually sell for commercial purposes, the road frontage, especially that parcel between the uh, access road to Publix and Western Boulevard. You'll recall that that has been appraised for well over $3 million. And one of the things we had discussed with the council in the past, and certainly for Mr. Sosa's benefit, was that we sell that and we look to buy large acreage in the future so that we could generally replicate what was done by a previous uh, council and mayor back when the commons was originally purchased. My memory is not perfect. My wife reminds me of that on a regular basis, but relative to city business, I believe that uh, when the commons was purchased, it was well over 200 acres, and the purchase was about 440 or $50,000. You're right. So hopefully when we are able, and we've had some inquiries regarding that corner, you will recall that Jacksonville Parkway which Ron and Anthony have worked on with the MPO and with the DOT. Jacksonville Parkway is proposed to extend across Western, go through the city property, up behind uh, Fire Station 4, eventually out to Ramsey Road. And when that happens, I think you're going to find that the property you currently own is going to be uh, prime for development. I would also remind you that by previous action of the city council, part of that property you have given a five-year option to, the partnership, to the partnership for children. So, and that should generate some money also to maybe accomplish some of the things that Michael's talking about. Now, the next step, and, and I do want to compliment Michael and Susan and also the GIS port, uh, folks that have helped create these, the work that they have done, if you had turned that over to a consultant, would easily have cost you seventy-five dollars to $100,000. This type of planning is essential, though, to go after the state parks and recreation and tourism grants as well as other grants. So when you see the final document sometime in May, uh, we encourage you to adopt it, recognizing it can be modified at any time but it is essential that we have this level of master plan to help us with grant applications. Any other questions for us? One more question. <clears throat> Going back to uh, Willingham Park. Willingham. Which one? Willingham. Willingham. Yes. Could've you know, it was, <clears throat> excuse me. It was mentioned about moving the basketball courts. Kerr Street. Did, Kerr Street, excuse me. Yeah, Kerr Street. Uh, what was the site, or what, did you all explore the possibility of that? Yeah, and, and we talked a little bit about that last meeting, and, and we feel like from, a, from a, a space perspective that ultimately the basketball court with a sidewalk leading to it is probably going to be best served in center field. We had also talked about the potential to put the existing, uh, or, or the restrooms that we're asking for, to build them on the back of not uh, existing Kerr Street, but an expanded Kerr Street, and similar to what Jack Amiet was, where you have indoor and outdoor restrooms that are separated. And uh, so, yeah, I think, we, I think we did. But when you see the final master plan, there you're going to see two options. You're going to see an option that generally leaves the basketball court where it is, because at the end of the day, this is council's decision you will see an option that moves it out to the outfill. But again, those you will see those two options uh, and then any other variations that you want us to show of any of the other parks. But you have not taken a final position on where that basketball court will wind up. Other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor, I know that uh, it, we're coming up on some breaks. If you would like, we can do number 12 and 13 and then have a break and then go into closed session.
Or you can have a break now. What's your preference? What do y'all want to do? Let's finish up the agenda. Yes. Okay. Okay. Proceed. Riverwalk Marina. We have three concepts that we'd like for you to give us some uh, direction on. As you know, when we bought the marina, the focus has been on building the waterfront. I'm pleased to tell you that very shortly we're going to be starting a summer marketing plan where you can get uh, four months of use of a dock down there for the price of three, and we're going to hope to fill that up during the summer. You will also recall that the building was flooded by Hurricane Florence. We received a grant of $73,000, I believe it was, as an alternate program. That building has been torn down. The alternate program is to build restrooms and a, what, for lack of a better term, a nice gazebo with sitting that would look out over the water. We'd like to show you three concept plans tonight. If you're on the water and you're looking back towards the land, this is one of the concepts where you would have something that replicates, and actually all three of the concepts replicates the bell towers here at City Hall. So you have uh, easy construction with uh, basically a vertical center section and then uh, tea sheds coming off of each side with restrooms. Looking at it from the side, you're now uh, generally uh, you know, looking towards the water is towards your right, the road is towards your left. You can see the mass of the upper portion, and on the left you can see at the bottom where the restrooms would be, and then you can see where the seating area. There'll also be obviously handicapped access for each of these three options. So the first one, again, this is what the view from the water would look like. This would be the side view. The second option, very similar from the water view, but it reduces the mass on the top, yet it will leave all of the area of the roof system and then the, also the tower open for architectural features so you'd really have some class with timbers. Then the third option, you'll notice you will have, instead of an enclosed upper portion, you would have an open upper portion that would not be accessible by the public. It would simply be for uh, what I'll call design purposes. Two things that I'm a little concerned about with options one and three is the mass of the top and the extra expense you go to for that because it's not usable space. If you will keep focusing on that particular component, let's go back to number two. You see how we have reduced the mass of the second floor. That will reduce the cost. I think it still leaves a very nice architectural flavor. So again, here's the side view of one, side view of two, side view of three. Before we talk about any other components, would you mind giving us some feedback? Uh, how do you feel about the mass of the second story in either one or two, I'm sorry, one or three, versus the mass in number two? You say it's not usable space, though. No, sir. It's just open, it would just be open air space. Two actually looks best to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sorry? In my opinion, option two looks about... I mean, sort of mimics the, the, uh, nice train, or the transportation yeah, center there you go. design, doesn't it? Yes, sir, it does. Can you go over to the front view? Yes, sir. Let's start at the front view. Now, we, are we going to change the name of the city according to that? <laughs> what does it actually say? Jasonville. I misspelled. Oh, no, yeah. no K. <laughs> K. <laughs> Well, if you'd, like to make the, minor if you'd like to make that motion, sir, I'll let you decide that. <laughs> Certainly not our intent. Myself. Well, Jerry, I actually thought riding around town we should change the name to uh, Circle K. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Moving, moving on quickly. Let's go back. Now, even though the mass of the second floor has changed, this is the view from the water in one. 
the view in the water from two, the view in the water from three. Now, let's go back in slower. The view from the water in three has the same, what I'll call curvilinear design where the city sign stand, uh, hangs for an architectural flavor, but it has the opening up there. Mm -hmm. Two has the same architectural feature on the first floor, but it closes in the second area. And then you can see again, so really uh, your choice would be either this view or this view. You do not have to make this decision tonight. What we'd like to do is get these to you in paper form or electronic form, have you study them for a week or so, but it is important that we move forward with this project because as you'll recall, the FEMA grant application requires this to be completed and operational by what day, John, in September? Accessible by top mobility of the railroads to the same day that Hurricane Florence hit us. Uh, question, question on the on the drawing. We, we have to be finished with this in a fairly rapid uh, time period. Sir, a question? Yes. Accessibility to the top part up here. It, no? No. And, and the reason why is as you walk through that, what you're actually going to be seeing is all the way up through there. It won't be a, a floor separating the first and second. It will be beams and architectural Rapper. features. So. I think you're going to be very proud of what you're going to have out there. So we will get this to you, and uh, if we can, we'll put this on a week away uh, or maybe two weeks, three weeks, whatever you're comfortable with, and then we'll move forward with the final we'll design. A week. Make up your mind in a week. I think I'm pretty made up. A week, okay. Everybody good? Yeah. Put on next, next week or next okay. time we meet. All right. <clears throat> Gail, this will only be a three-hour budget presentation. Uh, in all fairness, it's probably going to last about 10 minutes. So please, ma'am. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Thank you for letting me be here. Y'all know how much I like to talk, so it may be a little bit. We want to just kick off the budget and um, give you just a little flavor of what we're going to see in the next few weeks. So when we adopt the budget, we adopt a tax rate, our revenues, our expenditures, staffing levels, benefits, CIP, our fee schedule, and it covers our fiscal year July 1 to June 30th. <coughs> And this is required to be done prior to this June 30th for next year by law. Um, we're proposing a schedule to meet every Tuesday from now until adoption. Um, we would also ask that you entertain the idea of the public hearing for April 20th at your regular meeting. And then we'll have budget workshops as we go with a potential adoption of on May 18th and then if we don't adopt the budget, then we will have additional workshops as needed right on until we do adopt the budget. Um, this is, I've got several slides here that talk about the assumptions that went into building the budget. Um, we assume that the tax rate is going to remain the same at 64.2 cents and that the tax base remains stable. Um, and we also assume there's no change in the distribution formula for the sales tax and that the growth is modest. Um, water and sewer rates will increase by the 2.25% that we've discussed in the past. Um, we will bring you the rate model at a future meeting for you to see how that plays out over the next few years. <clears throat> Funding level for fuel will be the same as it was in previous budgets. That's $3.15 a gallon for unleaded and $3.45 for diesel. Um, just, if you'll remember, we don't pay the tax, so that's still a reasonable amount of money per gallon, even with the rising costs we're seeing. 
Um, the health insurance premiums are going to unfortunately need to increase again this year. I think the latest discussion was about 3% was what we would propose. That is not included in the current budget as it's proposed. That'll be a council decision at some future date. Um, the budget does include the 800 megahertz payment to the county of $710,000, and that comes from the four cent fund, <clears throat> just as it was in this year. We have one more payment in FY23 for $378,000. Um, the general fund is going to continue to subsidize the solid waste fund. The general fund has a $200,000 contingency. And as the budget is proposed now, PAL bill is the only funding source for paving. The recycling expense is going to begin in FY22, and that has been included in your proposed budget. However, the funding source for that will be a council decision at a later date. Um, our three-year ERP is built into the base, budge base budget, or the first year of the three-year ERP. And ERP, sir, stands for Equipment Replacement Plan. Mm -hmm. um, the Dix Crisis Center is still funded at $100,000. JOED is funded at $30,000 plus $30,000 for their capital cam campaign, and this will be year two of that. I don't remember, was that a three or a five year commitment? Five. Um, there are three levels of the DIs in your proposed book. There are a number of them that were approved by the city manager. There are several that are recommended, and then there are several that are not recommended by the, by the manager. <clears throat> um, the FY22 budget is balanced using fund balance, and you'll see a little bit later it's about $4 million. The Parkwood Regional Sewer Project, we're assuming that that's going to move forward and that we will fund that with long-term borrowing, and that has been built into the rate model. Retirement contributions are increasing another 1.2% to 11.3%, or about $357,000 in additional money. And we expect a similar increase in 23. And Mr. Sosa, for your uh, council's rec uh, let's do that <coughs> over. For the council's memory and for your information, the city employees are mandated to participate in the North Carolina State Retirement System. The Board of Trustees, or whatever the governing body of the retirement system is, mandated a year ago a series of four-step increases. So we do not actually have any, this is not a council decision. You are required to fund that. And as you can see, it has gone up uh, incrementally. And this year, it will increase again by $357,000. These are not small increases. Over the four-year step, the city will have to invest over $1.2 million more in retirement uh, contributions to the state plan than before the board made that decision. So that is a mandate that we are required to meet. Gail, yeah, what does the 11.3%, 11.3%? That's 11.3% of the salary is what the, of what city contributes to the retirement fund every year it's up up to the employees 3. contribute six percent of their salary and the city is now at 11.3 but it is of the total eligible payroll not every employee as you know is eligible for retirement but for all practical purposes we have roughly 570 employees with a very large payroll so that when you go up 1.2 percent it's significant money. Um, this budget also has $300,000 built in for the salary adjustment, as we have done in the last couple of years. Um, Jack Amiet improvements will be funded by short-term borrowing from the general fund, short-term being less than five years. Um, and then there will be consideration of a good COLA by the mayor and the council. And also, let me explain the difference between uh, the second bullet and the fourth bullet. 
The $300,000 for salary adjustments, that's where we do analysis to make sure there's equity in the pay. That is not your cost of living increase. So the 300000 is built in. So, for example, if uh, you have someone who is hired in and based upon, and I'll give you an example, if we hire uh, a signal technician and in order to get what we want, that person is actually going to be paid more than a person in the same grade and the same job uh, that has been with us two years, we adjust that salary to have equity. The COLA cost of living adjustment is something that the management does not ever set. That is something that you and the council set. But that is not built into the budget. However, the salary adjustments are. So. And just a little brief overview of the general fund revenues and where we're at compared to the amended budget for this year. The um, property tax is just seeing a very, very small increase. The sales tax, um, also small increase. I did see the league uh, projections today, and I think they said 2.5% for sales tax just as a general. So I projected a little less than that. <clears throat> the uh, intergovernmental revenues are down. The franchise taxes have been decreasing over the years, so that's just as it has been. Um, the charges for services are down. That's a combination of the recreation fees because we're not having the recreation programs and the passport uh, acceptance fees because we're not doing that right now. And then the appropriated fund balance in the amended budget is 8.3 million and the proposed is 4 point almost two. Usually at this point in the proposed budget, it's a little less than that, but with the reduced fees and it's just a little higher this year. But let's, uh, let's talk about the fund balance for just a second. When you adopted the budget last year, the projected utilization of fund balance was in the range of $3 million. So let's talk about how it grew to eight, because you really, it, it's not some major over expenditure. Let's explain how that happens. Um, part of it happens when you've ordered a truck say a garbage truck and it doesn't come in by June 30th, that increases next year's budget because it rolls over. We've already ordered it, so it increases the budget as an amendment. Um, we've put a million dollars towards paving out of the fund balance and we've set aside, I think most of the money for the Jack Amiette project out of the fund balance already. So all of those things happen this year and increase that. Yeah, normally, and that's an important thing, normally you balance the budget by spending somewhere between two and a half and three and a half million dollars of your fund balance. And the good news is, as you saw with the audit this past year, when the audit came in, you didn't actually spend any of that fund balance. You were actually able to add to the fund balance, and that's how you took the million dollars towards additional paving. So, thank you. Based on these projections, fair is here. What percent of the fund balance will be available in fiscal year 22 budget? Will be utilized. You're you're uh, roughly at 25 we, million. We mean we maintained what 15 percent last yes, year sir. or this year. What per, what will that percent be for fiscal year 22? Yes, I'm not understanding the question. Of the, of the proposed budget, and let's just go to that that way. The proposed general fund budget, and I think you have a number, uh, you have the total, is that on the next slide? Yes. Okay. Okay, your general fund budget is $52 million and change. The fund balance is roughly $20 million. So you're probably... 40%, sir? Mr. Thomas, you're the mathematician in the group, about 40%. Yeah. So you're, you're substantial. It's 40% or so of a fund balance okay. relative to your budget. We will make that as a budget note, though, and get you details. 
And this is just a, a really summarized view of the operating funds and where the budgets are. And you can see they're all um, down from the prior year amended budget or for the current year amended budgets, except for the solid waste fund. And that's primarily related to the recycling fee that we have not had to pay in the past, but that we will begin to pay in November, I believe it is. Yes, and that is all I have. I think we need to ask you to schedule the public hearing for the budget, and we propose that you do that on April 20th. Okay, would everybody? Okay. okay. And then Dr. Woodruff's going to talk about how you want to review the budget. Okay. One of the first things um, I want to remind you, this is your budget. And we are here to provide as much detail and spend as many hours as you would like to. When Mr. Sosa was meeting with the staff right after he was appointed, uh, we showed him the thousand page book. And he said that he is, uh, he is eager to look at the thousand page book. That thousand page book is available to every one of you. And it shows literally every penny that's going to be spent. It shows for every department, every line item. So you can see salaries, benefits, retirement, health insurance, supplies, capital, everything that's there. Historically, we have not used the individual line item book, the thousand page book. What we have historically done is one of these three options. And that is to either have the line item details where we literally go through this book and then we also depart, talk about department issues. We'll spend a minute talking about what a department issue is. A department issue is where someone wants something that we cannot put into the base budget that I do not believe it is my authority to deny. So for example, you will have a department issue from the police department asking for six police officers. You've heard that request. You will hear a department issue from the fire department asking for four additional firefighters plus additional. That's not in the base budget. I will give you recommendations based upon funding availability as to whether I think you can afford that. You will make the final decision on those department issues. A number of department issues, though, for example, the fire department was asking for a new record management system. I approved that and put it in the base budget. Why? Because it's only $35,000 a year. Now, while it is $35,000 a year, again, we can absorb that. But when you deal with $600,000 for something big, we obviously can't absorb that. So department issues you will find that we will present all those to you. You will see those that I have recommended and put in the base budget. If you disagree with that, we can take them right out of the base budget. You'll also find that there's some that I'm recommending to you that are not in the base budget. And then there's those that I'm not recommending to you that are not in the base budget, but all of those will wind up on your seat to make the final decision. One of the other things that we have done is to option two, smaller department roll-ups with large department details. Let me give you an example of that. The mayor and council's budget, we consider that to be a small department. Almost no changes. So when we go through that, what we're going to do, and let me actually find that page. What we're going to do is say the FY21 budget for the mayor and council was $514,245. The proposed budget is $513,973 or a reduction of approximately $50. Do you want to go in detail? And Mr. Sosa told us he would like to go into detail and look at all of that. But that's what a small department when you say small department roll up, that's what that means. On the other hand, large department detail. Large department detail would be something such as your police department. 
And I'm not sure what page that is on, so page 89, thank you. So on page 89, you will find a budget of $20.1 $20 million, $20 million. In that budget, we would go into substantial detail talking to you about how that is being spent. So that's what option two is, small department roll-ups, large department discussions. Option three is simply the base budget plus the major increases and DIs. What is that? This is your base budget. Instead of looking at individual departments, we would really talk about the issues that we are dealing with, such as some of the large D, uh, d departmental issues or DIs, as well as some of the other major challenges, some of which we've discussed. So we leave it to you as to how you would like to approach the budget, because again, it is your budget. Before you decide that, there is one other comment that I would like to make, especially for the public's benefit. In your budget on page 18, there is a history from 2010 through 2022 or 21 of your tax rate and your assessed values. I know this is not on the screen. If you have a, a book, if you'll turn to page 18, I'd like to min take a minute talking with you about that. The real property value in 2010 for the city of Jacksonville was $2,853,000,000. Now, over time, every four years, we have reassessments. Today, as of the last assessment and the last information from the tax office, your real property is three million fifty-five million. So if you look, in a 10-year period, it has gone up by $200 million. So I'm going to say that again. Think of all the growth that has occurred in Jacksonville in a 10-year period. Your property tax base has only gone up $200 million. That's pretty amazing. The other thing I would point out is the next column, which the public can't see, so I will talk about that. What has been your tax rate? In 2010, your tax rate was 53.8. Your tax rate today is 64.2. I will remind you that in 2014, it was the only year that you have increased taxes in a 10-year period. Now, I'm not saying this preparing the public for a tax increase because I'm not recommending that to you. I think we can adopt the budget and have all the things in it that this city needs to continue with the progress that you have asked us to do and that you have led on doing without a tax increase. But in 2014, you had to raise the tax by 10 cents. Mayor, do you remember why I we do. had to raise the tax? I certainly do. And what was that reason? Because the county cut the sale, our sales tax uh, exactly distribution. Right. So just for the public, you know, we want you to realize that in a 10-year period, you have raised taxes once. And that was based upon something that was done to you, not something you chose to do yourself. So this is your budget. Uh, we can meet as often. I do know that on uh, one week from tonight, one council member will be gone. And two weeks from tonight, a second council member will be gone. So you will not be all seven of you. We can adjust the schedule as you want. If you would like to have budget meetings on the 13th and the 20th, recognizing you'll have one person absent, we can certainly adjust the schedule. But that is totally up to you. That's our budget presentation for this evening, sir. Any thoughts or recommendations? Thoughts or recommendations, Council? As far as not being able to be here, this discussion will be... Or they can watch it on G10, correct? 
Yes. And play back and play back at a later time. Also, correct. Yes, and also, uh, you know, while they may not, just like Mr. Warden is not in the chamber tonight physically, he is in the in the chamber mentally, and certainly we can do the same as, as for the individuals who will be absent those two days if they would like to join. At this point, they're going to go to the, uh, we're going to go ahead and do the reports now. And I'll start off. North Carolina Special Olympics Law Enforcement Torch Run Committee presented the Jacksonville Police Department with the 2020 Director's Award. The Director's Award is given to only two of 84 participating agencies and was presented to Officer Chris Padrick, uh, Special Olympics Liaison. This award recognizes outstanding leadership, dedication, and outstanding commitment to achieve the goals of raising funds to support Special Olympics of North Carolina. The North Carolina Law Enforcement Torch Run for Special Olympics unites officers from law enforcement agencies across the state in an effort to raise funds and awareness for Special Olympics North Carolina. Jacksonville Police Department has participated in the North Carolina Law Enforcement Torch Run since 2003 and has raised over $200,000. Even with restrictions due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the agency raised $16,000 in 2020. Very good. Kudos to them for, for doing that. The uh, community, uh, the city of Jacksonville is proud to recognize the CDBG program for continued commitment to our community by proclaiming April 5th through April 9th, 2021 as National Community Development Week in the city of Jacksonville. The community development block grant uh, program funding has had a significant impact on our local economy through physical redevelopment, quality of life initiatives, and improved local tax base. The City of Jacksonville has successfully utilized CDBG funding to resolve pressing local problems through neighborhood revitalization, such as downtown housing initiative, housing rehabilitation programs, demolition and clearance of dilapidated structures, and funding for nonprofit service organizations, also construction of affordable housing and reconstruction of public facilities. And when I presented this here in the chambers to Tracy uh, one day last week. I had the honor yesterday uh, to present uh, the an Outstanding Citizen Award. Uh, this week I was honored to present the Outstanding Citizen Award to Millie Chalk. Uh, Millie served as the district manager in, uh, with Duke Energy Progress for over 32 years, with nine of those years serving as the governmental and community relations uh, manager. She will be retiring in just a few days on April 9th. During her tenure, she assisted the city of Jacksonville in countless ways, including helping with downtown revitalization efforts, Hurricane Florence recovery, the Public Service Commission rate schedule issues, and with the conversion of our streetlights to LEDs, which has saved the city a substantial amount of money over time. And it's also brightened the city up very nicely. Uh, the council and I extend our gratitude to Ms. Chalk for all she has done for our community and wish her all the best for her retirement. And the one thing that Millie did stress was it was a team effort. So we're going to miss Millie in that position. Mm -hmm. Mr. Bittner. I have no report tonight, Mr. Jack. No report. Just welcome again. Thank you. Okay. Right. No report. Mr. Sosa? No. Dr. Washington? Okay. So this time I will entertain a motion. Oh, we got a one city moment here. I'm sorry. The, in the interest of time, let's uh, go ahead and, and skip that. Okay. And we'll go straight into the closed session. All right. So I'm going I'm to entertain a motion to go into closed session for the discussion of the uh, purpose of instructing staff in regards to negotiating property act position. Pursuant to the general statutes. So moved. Second. All, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay.